Hello, Izzy Lawrence, just here to say you're listening to a bonus episode of Terrible Lizards. This was initially put out for the Patreons back in August, but we're releasing it on general release now. And don't worry, if you are a Patreon, we've got another special bonus episode for you on the Patreon page. You can go to patreon.com forward slash Terrible Lizards. Right, on with the show. Welcome to Terrible Lizards, a podcast about dinosaurs with Dr. David Home and Izzy Lawrence. Welcome to a special bonus edition of Terrible Lizards. And on this edition, if that makes sense, uh, we, well, we've got a guest because it turns out Dave doesn't know anything about this subject at all. Absolutely nothing. You may as well be talking about squirrels. So uh, we've got a special guest. Well, and I'll, I'll hand it over to Dave, the, the person who doesn't know anything uh, about this, uh, to introduce our special guest. Hello. Uh, yes. No. I know. I know nothing about ankylosaurs whatsoever. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Of course, we're, people are watching. People are watching this. People are listening to this, and of course, can't see what I can see, which is other people giggling. Uh, is well putting me up. So no, I don't know much about ankylosaurs. Certainly enough to talk about great confidence for an hour without rereading tons and tons of papers and notes and books, which is loads of effort. And it's much easier and much more fun to get someone on who does know loads of stuff. And so we called up Victoria Arbor. So hello, Victoria. Hello. And and you are uh, and you are Canadian, or do you just live in Canada? She's uh, very I'm, Canadian. <laughs> I'm very, extremely very Canadian, and I uh, somewhat awkwardly also now live in a city called Victoria, out on the west coast of Canada. So I you double down. Vancouver Island in uh, British Columbia, and yeah, so now I'm Victoria from Victoria out here. Wow! So the, the Vancouver Island, so you get to see lots of cool wildlife because you get the killer, the orcas. Sorry, not the killer whales, the orcas out there. Don't yeah, you? we do get orcas. Um, I have not seen any orcas in person since I moved here two years ago, but you, they do live. We have a sort of like a big extended family group called the J-Pod, the Southern Resident Killer Whales. Um, uh, the museum I work at, the Royal BC Museum, we've actually, since I got here, we've been putting together an exhibit about orcas. So it's been pretty cool to learn about orcas. Um, and they're pretty amazing animals. But the, most of the wildlife I see are like raccoons and deer. So that's, like, <laughs> that's fair enough. Um, Trash yeah, But they're very good, very good um, Canadian wildlife out here. So <laughs> well, that's good. But no ankylosaurs. Sadly, tragically, no ankylosaurs. Not, so, not yet. Not yet. Because Victoria has been digging up dinosaurs in BC, which is not really famous for its dinosaur collection. No, it's true. Um, so yeah, in Canada, like the most, the place where you mostly find dinosaurs—not the only place, but like the big place—is Alberta, right? So the province right next door to where I live. Um, and that's because it's got like these beautiful badlands and it's very hot and dry and it's nice and flat. Um, and I live in a province that is mostly mountains um, mm -hmm. or like river valleys. And so it's a bit more challenging. Um, but I in the first field season since I moved here, I was able to go up to a place up in the far north of the province uh, into a place called Spatsizi Plateau Wilderness provincial park um and i like helicoptered for an hour and got dropped off on the side of a mountain and then hiked around and looked for dinosaur bones so that was a pretty that's big change the movie, that is um, that's amazing <laughs> i got to see some wolves and some caribou and it was like wow. a pretty cool experience and then i got snowed on in august and had to call it off <laughs> because it was actually like fairly dangerous so it, it snowed I, I on assume... us for like over a day like up on this mountain and i was like please rescue us now so <laughs> <laughs> right uh, the the us is quite important because when you said you just got dropped off from a helicopter it did sound like they just shoved you out the door <laughs> and then headed south <laughs> well it was only three Three of us ultimately okay, so it was so, um, so myself group. uh yeah it's small because helicopters are um hellaciously expensive so yeah. you do one helicopter because that's what we could afford um and so it was myself and then my good friends Jacqueline Richmond who was the collections manager at the time here at the museum and then um Thomas Cullen who was at the field museum and is now at the North Carolina Museum working with Lindsay Zano um yeah so just a small crew um but a lot of fun so it's it's probably rocks from the very end of the age of dinosaurs. So it could be sort of like Mastrichtian, so like 68, 67 million years old. Um, but it's just like way up there and there haven't really been a lot of things found. So we did start to find bones, but we basically had like one afternoon before it snowed on us. And so we didn't get to find too much stuff. But just the fact that there was actually like bones up in this like mountain in BC was like pretty exciting. So 
So I'm excited to get back. And if there hadn't been a global pandemic, I would be there right now. But instead, it, I... It uh, is the biggest tragedy of the pandemic, you're correct. So. It's, <laughs> it, is, it is a minor complaint in the big scheme of things. But I am very excited to get back there next next summer, hopefully. So can I start from, like, I, I I take the, you know, podcast representative of somebody who remembered dinosaurs from when they were five and really liked them and sort of finding us back again. What is an ankylosaur? So what does it look like? When was it about? And just give me the shape of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so ankylosaurs are, like, my favourite group of dinosaurs. They're, I mean, all dinosaurs are good dinosaurs, but ankylosaurs <laughs> are, like, the goodest of the good dinosaurs, in my opinion. Um, and so they are the ones I spend most of my time thinking about. Um, so uh, an ankylosaur picture like the fattest dinosaur that you can possibly imagine. So a very like stout round dinosaur um, covered in like spikes and knobs and like hard bony plates. Um, they have four legs. So they walk on four legs. They probably can't rear up under their hind legs. So they're basically like walking spiky coffee tables. That's what we always joke about. <laughs> and um, there's there's sort of like two groups within ankylosaurs. So one group um, keeps a flexible tail, just like a regular dinosaur tail. Um, and they usually have a relatively long snout and they don't necessarily have big horns over their eyes, but they do have big spikes on their shoulders. And those are the notosaurid ankylosaurs. So they, and that's a little bit what many of the earlier ankylosaurs look like too, before they kind of differentiate into these two groups. Uh, and then there's another group of ankylosaurs, somewhat confusingly called the ankylosaurid ankylosaurs. <laughs> so if you have an id on it, then that makes it a separate group. <laughs> um, and those ones tend to have, in general, like a shorter snout, like sort of a boxier skull with big horns over the eyes and on the cheeks. Um, they usually don't have big shoulder spikes, but they will have like big triangular plates kind of along their flanks. And then most significantly, they have this weaponized tail that's kind of like a sledgehammer. So they're, th that's the group that evolves the big sort of blob of bone at the tip of the tail and they get a very stiff tail and together that makes the tail club. Cool. Are these um, dinosaurs, are, are they using this club against predators? What is this club for, do we think? Ooh, so that's the, that's like the fun question that I've been working on for a long time. A long actually. time. <laughs> a long time. Um, and so there's, there's a couple of questions I've been asking before we get to who they fight with, and that's could they fight with it. Mm. Um, so just because it looks like a weapon doesn't necessarily mean it was a weapon. And so that's the first place to start is like, could it actually be used as a weapon? And so back when I was like just a wee baby grad student, um, as a master's student at the University of Alberta, um, I did some research where I... Uh, took like 3D scans of tail clubs and I made them into these uh, models called finite element analysis models. So they basically, you take a 3D model and they turn it into like a bunch of like Lego bricks and then you can um, apply a force to it and you can tell the computer, okay, it has like this, like these sort of elastic properties or like this density. And then you can see basically if a tail club will break under the forces you apply to it. Wow. So I sort of calculated how hard an ankylosaur could like swing its tail and smash into something. And then I put that force onto it to see if it would break. So if a tail club breaks, if it hits something hard, then it's probably not like regularly being used as a weapon. It's kind of like, you know, if you like punch your fist into someone and your hand breaks, like it's not a super good weapon, right? So um, it's not necessarily like why you evolved a fist of fury, right? So um, <laughs> avoid the jaw, aim for the rib cage. You're less likely oh, to break okay. hand on a rib cage than the face. The, the head is quite a difficult, don't punch people in the face. Liver, that's your best bet. There the you go. Tip. Top tip for <laughs> your own kind of sort of lower too, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, you could. Uh... Right in the old kidney. Uh, and so... <laughs> or, or other, lo other or, locations are available. Other sort of places, <laughs> yes. Dead legging is bad as well. But anyway. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so basically what I found out from that is that, like, for the most part, tail clubs are really good at withstanding very strong impact forces. So you can smash a tail club and it will kind of absorb that that pressure, that stress, and it won't just snap immediately. Uh, but there's a ton of assumptions that go into that. And so when you're doing this kind of testing, you try to sort of like change around your your input parameters, right? So like 
maybe the muscles need to be a bit bigger or maybe your density isn't quite right in the tail club or things like that. So I sort of like played around with it. And there are scenarios where you can kind of change the input parameters such that a tail club will break if it smashes something really hard. But probably for the most part, an ankylosaur would be, you know, it's a pretty formidable weapon. Uh, they could they could hit with enough force to like smash the bone of like, say, a tibia, like a shin bone of a of a tyrannosaur for example and even if it wasn't breaking bone i mean it would still really really hurt to get <laughs> hit by like it would it, at minimum cause like soft tissue injuries right so so it's a pretty good weapon and a lot of ankylosaur tails uh also had like very sharp spikes going all the way down the side of the tail so even if like the big bludgeon at the end doesn't get you like you're still getting like stabbed with little stabby spikes like as it hits you so it's a pretty good weapon i would say and well, there's the so there are there are tyrannosaurs which live in the environments with ankylosaurs with tail clubs so the ankylosaur is ankylosaurs which have broken legs now there's no way to demonstrate that that was broken by an ankylosaur but it's i've seen i think i've seen three and i've heard of a couple of others and when you know tyrannosaurs are fairly common we have loads of specimens of them but i'm struggling to think of many other theropods from anywhere that have broken shins and ankles and like i say i've seen three and i've heard of at least a couple more so it's very notable that at a time where there were big animals with big smashy things, swinging big smashy things at kind of ankle height, there are big carnivorous dinosaurs with busted ankle and shin bones. Um, so that fits into what Victoria's side of things as well. You know, you can pull evidence together from different lines. And yeah. yeah. It's something that's like super tantalizing, right? And yeah. I know that like Darren Tankey at the Terrell Museum has... Um, previously published some work showing that tyrannosaurs do seem to have like a higher frequency of broken and healed shin bones um, compared to like other groups of big meat eaters that lived at different times. So that's like super interesting. But like Dave just said, it's really hard to know 100% for sure if that broken shin is from an ankylosaur because maybe the tyrannosaur tripped or maybe some other animal hit it or who knows. So it's very hard to they're tell like clumsy. why. They're very clumsy what, very, very, They're very <laughs> stupid, right? So. <laughs> Tell me about this club at the end of the tail, though. Are we talking about yeah. adapted vertebrae or what? what's it made of, this big club? Yeah, it's a super interesting thing. No other animal really has done something quite like this ever in evolution. So I think that makes ankylosaurs pretty special. So the club is sort of two parts. We call it, there's the handle and the knob. I didn't come up with the <laughs> terminology, but that's just what it is. Um, so when I am at conferences, I get to stand up in front of a room and use the word knob a whole lot which I think is possibly even funnier um, if you're British than if you're Canadian. So, um, uh, hello, viewers. I know, we find, we, find, <laughs> we find doorknobs and butter knobs hilarious. That's... <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I'm mostly just grateful that the handle isn't also called the shaft because then I think I would be a ghost at conferences. <laughs> from having to say that. So anyway, so the handle is made of modified vertebrae. And so ankylosaur tail vertebrae in the back half of the tail, where like the tail club part, um, if you look at them from the top, they're super interesting because they look like a whole bunch of very skinny V shapes, like all like locked together. So it's super weird. It's basically the the neural spine and the prezygopophyses, the little like knobbly bits on the top of a vertebra um, get really long and they like lock together and they overlap the vertebra in front of it. And then the one behind overlaps the one that you're looking at right there. So they're pretty neat looking. And then the actual like the centra, so the like so the sort of disc part gets really long like and elongate. And then the hemal arch, which is the part on the bottom also does the same thing. So it's this very like solid locked together unit of tail, but that isn't what creates that big ball of bone at the end. That's actually made out of osteoderms, uh, a whole separate part of the skeleton. And so osteoderms are the part of the ankylosaur that makes all of the spikes all over their body. 
So we don't really have anything like that in our bodies. Um, thank goodness. Uh, so osteoderms are bones that grow in your skin, which is pretty cool. Um, they grow in the lower level of your skin called the dermis. And so osteoderm basically just means like skin bone, right? So osteo means bone and derm means skin. So it's pretty self-explanatory once you know what those terms mean. Uh, so these are things that grow in the dermis. So like in us, that's where our like hair and sweat glands live. But if you are a an armadillo, that is where your carapace grows. Um, and if you're a crocodile, that's where those like big bony scales that underlie the spikes on a crocodile are growing. And same with ankylosaurs. So osteoderms have evolved over and over again. There's probably like some deep genetics inside most like land vertebrates that give us the ability to have osteoderms, but then only some animals actually like turn that on. And ankylosaurs are one of them. So that's pretty neat. Anyway, so over their body, they have all different like shapes and sizes of osteoderms. Um, some of them are just little tiny millimeter sized pebbles. Uh, called, that I like to call ossicles. Um, some of them are like big discs. Most of them have at least a keel on them. Some of them are big triangular spikes. And at the tip of the tail, they become like big half moon shaped, like spongy thick bones that envelop the entire tip of the tail. So there's usually at least like two big ones, like one on each side of the tail, and then a bunch of little ones that kind of like cover up the very tip of the tail. And then that all fuses together into one big blob called the knob. In my head, I'm almost imagining sort of like an ax head in the sense that it's it's got a sort of like a hammer. Yeah, it's yeah. very flat. It's 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 kind of disky, isn't it? It's not a, I think people think of it as being a sphere mostly. They get drawn as like a sphere. So I totally get like why people say that because they're yeah. sort of a weird non-intuitive shape. But it's it's like if you look at it right from the top down, they're often quite circular, although a few of them actually become quite pointed. So different species have actually slightly different shapes. But like a good standard is like generally kind of like a circle if you're looking at it from above. But then if you were looking at it from behind, um, some of them actually look almost like a lemon. So there's often like a keel. So they're usually kind of like flatter. So they're like wider than tall, I guess. Pill shaped. Yeah. 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 Well, a very, a very oblate spheroid. Yeah. There are other dinosaurs with weapons on their tails because I thought Stegosaurus had those spikes. Yeah, absolutely. So Stegosaurus has spikes. And what's really neat is that Stegosaurs are like the cousins to Ankylosaurs, right? So they're the next most closely related group of dinosaurs. Like Ankylosaurs, they have osteoderms. So the big plates on a Stegosaurus back are also osteoderms. Um, and in fact, like early stegosaurs have more than just osteoderms on the two rows on their back. They have like more on different parts of their body and they just sort of lose them as you go towards stegosaurus. Uh, but yeah, so the big cones on the tip of the tail are a weapon in stegosaurus. So that's pretty interesting that these two groups of dinosaurs evolved tail weaponry. Um, but stegosaurs always have a fairly flexible tail and the spikes, um, they're, they're just such a different shape. They're, you know, they're a piercing weapon rather than like a, a bludgeoning weapon, I suppose. And, but there's others too. So there's, there's at least a couple of sauropods and possibly more that have tail clubs. I feel like we need a different word for those because they're so different, different yeah. um, but they're definitely the same. So I know a lot of people use club to refer just to the knob part, but the, yeah. that stiff part of the ankylosaur tail is really key to that adaptation. I usually use it to refer to that entire structure. And so in a sauropod, um, there are examples where they have basically like a knob. They have sort of like an inflated bulbous tail tip, and that's usually from the vertebrae themselves kind of like getting big and, and blobby um, and fusing together. And they're usually quite a lot smaller than an ankylosaur tail club as well. But those are always on flexible tails as far as we know. Yeah. So it's quite a different um, kind of weapon, really, which is pretty interesting that there's like these very interesting things. And so one of the research projects I did a few years ago um, as a postdoc with Lindsay Zano down in North Carolina was we looked at the evolution of tail weaponry. Um, so this is one of the things that I found really interesting is ankylosaurs have this really cool tail weapon, but tail weapons are really not that common in most animals. Like specialized adaptations on your tail to use as a weapon are super rare. So um, ankylosaurs do it, stegosaurs do it, a few sauropods do it. 
And then there's sort of two other like putative examples of tail weaponry in like animals, basically, um, and, or, or sorry, in like land living animals. So not, in, not including like fish or things like that or invertebrates, which are obviously like a whole other thing. Um, but basically, there's a very weird group of extinct turtles called the Myolanid turtles. And they have um, a, a tail that's kind of encased in osteoderms that makes kind of like a tube at the tip of the tail. And then it has spikes coming off of the tube. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and then there's this big group of uh, armored mammals called glyptodonts, which are basically like giant herbivorous armadillos that uh, mm -hmm. also encase the tail in osteoderms into like a continuous tube. And uh, just like in ankylosaurs, the back half of the tail gets stiff and then they kind of inflate the tip of the tube and create almost like a knob um, like in an ankylosaur but it's all made out of osteoderm which is pretty neat and uh, yeah and that's about it in terms of sort of very specialized adaptations beyond just having like quills or spikes like you have on the rest of your body and so we tried to look at like why that is so why do so few animals evolve these like specialized tail adaptations because like from where i'm sitting i feel like having weaponry on your tail is a much better evolutionary solution than having weaponry on your head which is really the most common place to have a weapon if you're a a tetrapod um or like an amniote for example so like most weapons are if you think about like a moose or like a bighorn sheep or antelope you know they have horns that come off the you know off the skull and they fight face to face but you know if you're fighting face to face like that's like where your eyes and your brain and your mouth so all these like very important like things for being alive are located and so there's like high chance of damage right and so it's kind of interesting that you know more animals don't take advantage of a tail which seems a lot more easily sacrificed in the big scheme of things than any part of your head but it's harder to focus a tail because you can't see where it is. Whereas if you've got it on your head, you can really target it because your eyes are there. So this is something that I think is really interesting because a lot of people say this to me and I agree. Um, but I think that there's a very interesting like human bias there, right? Because we don't have tails. And so it's really hard for us <laughs> to imagine um Think consciously yourself. moving a tail well i don't have a tail. <laughs> I, I don't, don't have know a tail about <laughs> no shame to people with tails it happens sometimes and it's fine but we don't have like long tails yeah. right and so um you know, when you're walking around, you don't need to see your legs to know where you're walking for the most part, right? Um, you know, you don't need to like watch your feet unless you're doing something very fancy, like say you're like dancing or something and you don't have like a muscle memory of it, right? Um, when you're walking, you just kind of walk and you have a good sense of like where your legs are in space, right? Or things like your arms, like, you know, if you know that like a cup is over here, you can move your arm without, you know, looking necessarily. I'm practicing right, right now and it works. So, so this, um, sorry, I'm, go I'm going to interrupt because this this is one thing that as a biologist drives me nuts. So everyone talks about the five senses and humans have way more than five senses. And that's that's a really good one to get people to do is close your eyes and bring your fingers together. Yeah, you can, you, yeah, you know, you, can, you right. can do it. Did you did you see that? Did you smell it? Did you hear it? There wasn't right. any touch on the way in and you certainly didn't taste it. Exactly. But you know where your body is. Yeah. yeah and, and it doesn't that, require you know, those inverted commas, five senses. Exactly. And that sort of spatial awareness sense is called proprioception, right? Um, it's kind of like an awareness of like where your body is in space and where your limbs are, right? And so um, my, and like, you, we cannot test this in an ankylosaur, obviously, but I highly suspect that an ankylosaur or any animal with a tail has a reasonably good sense of like where their tail is in space. And I think especially about animals that like actively use the tail as like a locomotive organ or a grasping organ so things like chameleons or monkeys um or you know any animal that's like really actively using the tail probably knows where that tail is in space at least mostly right and i mean you can miss you can overshoot same as like you know if you're anything that a human is doing where you like i don't know you like go to reach for a cup and you just like smash it off your desk or something never happens to me i'm perfect i think you're fine <laughs> <laughs> 
Anyway, so this idea that they, and, and it's true, I don't think an ankylosaur could necessarily like easily see its tail necessarily because they are extremely fat and they have very small necks and not very big heads and not very big brains. So, um, but I don't, and like a lot of the times when we draw them, we sort of draw them like, you know, kind of like looking around at their tail and I'm not really sure they would need to do that. I mean, I also think that if you just get swiping your tail, like you're going to hit something if you're like six meters long, right? So... My background is in history, so I did a lot of research about the suffragettes and how they avoided capture and that sort of thing. And one thing they did do was they used Indian clubs and they just wheeled them round like that so the police just couldn't get close enough. And you could you can actually it doesn't last very long, so eventually you go in, but it stops people in their tracks when they have a big weapon that's spinning yeah. around in front of them. Even yeah. even wielded by a very sort of little lady with small wrists, that's still not something you want to get close to. So the yeah, idea yeah. of a <laughs> The fact that it couldn't see the tail is probably even more reason to keep back. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, yeah, you... it's not like a precision weapon necessarily, right? So, but yeah. You, right, but you really don't want to get hit. And as Victoria says, you know, the, these are absolutely leg breakers. And, you know, a carnivore that breaks a leg is a dead that's carnivore. basically fatal. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, well, or at least it's going to have a real nasty time. So as we say, these theropods we talked about, you know, there is healing on these things. They're not just snapped in half. But again, right. that animal is taking days or weeks before it's hunting again. That's really pretty serious. And they're, they're going to learn to leave them alone. Related point to what you said a second ago is the size of these things. We haven't really mentioned that, I don't yeah, think. Yeah, I'm point. picturing about the size of a small puppy. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, when, I... when Victoria said coffee table, think dining table. I yeah. Mean, the, the big ankylosaurs are, what, eight, eight-ish plus metres? Yeah, so many ankylosaurs are probably, or like ankylosaurid ankylosaurs, sorry, I often yeah. use it like synonymously. I really yeah, should. I know, and it's, it's um, a pain. Yeah, I do. Uh, well. <laughs> anyway, so many of the tail clubbed ankylosaurs, um, they are in the sort of six meter range for the most part. So a lot of the like Campanian ones, so the ones that we would find in Alberta, um, they're in the sort of like six meter range, about half of which is tail, right? So they actually have a pretty long tail for their body. Um, they're, they're fairly, they're fat, but long tailed dinosaurs. So these aren't like super short tails. Like think about like a ceratopsian, and they actually have kind of a short tail. Um, so these guys are, they have really weird proportions basically. Um, so I also just wanted to say while we were thinking about it, um, that, uh, I like the idea of them smashing shins so much that I actually incorporated that into a species name a few years ago. <laughs> and so I named a new dinosaur, um, Zool. So the Zool is the genus name, and that's after a Ghostbusters monster, and that's because of what the head looked like, but it had this beautiful tail preserved. And so the species name is Curvastator, and that means destroyer of shins in Latin. And so that's sort of like playing on this idea that they could use it for, you know, clubbing a shin of a a, a predating, you know, tyrannosaur of some sort. So, How did you get away with Zool in the first place? How? <laughs> so Zool was, so this was a project I worked on with um, my, my then postdoc supervisor, um, David Evans, while I was at the ROM, uh, the Royal Ontario Museum, sorry, that's in Toronto. And um, we had this beautiful specimen that we were writing up and we had realized that it was probably a new species. And so we were starting to play around with, names and i just jokingly was like you know it kind of looks like zool from ghostbusters so zool is like the terror dog that sigourney weaver like turns into or is possessed by or whatever that is um and david and i are like both in our 30s and so <laughs> ghostbusters is like a thing that we watched when we were little and um it just kind of stuck and then i was like well do you want to just name it zool and just see what happens if they like let us do that so so basically zool italicized is the genus and zool not italicized is the movie monster now um the, the and the editors awesome. didn't make us change it so well that's I the was... thing that's, that's the thing is like you know as he says like you know how did he get away with that because all the other paleontologists are also sci-fi and fantasy nerds <laughs> that's, that's ultimately the reason I, I think we had one i try to remember exactly i think when we had the the reviews were good for the paper so you know it goes peer reviewed so other people have to like vet your science and everything and I think one of the reviewers was not like a huge fan of the name, but we were like, oh, whatever, because <laughs> nice. we liked it. But so, I, I um, remember because we talked about um, we talked about Zool with Kate Boss Ralph, didn't we? Yes. And mm -hmm. and 
apparently this is a really well preserved specimen it's it's basically one of the very best like i hate to say like the best because there's different like types of best if that makes sense but i mean it's like you know one of the very very best specimens that's ever been found um so beautiful skull um basically complete body all the way to the tail and when it was prepared so it was found belly side up and when it was prepared and flipped over and prepped down from the top side it it had all of the skin and armor in place so really spectacular specimen um the original description was based off the skull and the tail which were what were prepared in like 2017 when i was at the rom uh the specimen went on exhibit at the rom in 2018 now it's been fully prepared and David and I are actually like this summer working on writing up the description of the post crania and the body. And so hopefully we'll be able to share like, you know, really nice pictures of the whole thing with everyone pretty soon. So cool. Yeah. And kylosaurs are kind of weird like that. So the other great one, which is a nodosaur, is Braille Pelter. What's a nodosaur? We have discussed nodosaurs. Well, nodosaurs are the ones which don't have tail clubs. Ah, But when people yeah. are saying, like, this is the one of the best ones ever, one of the other best ones ever, or, again, not just ankylosaurs, I think dinosaurs. Like, Zool mm-hmm. is genuinely up there. If you were making, or maybe a top 20 rather than top 10, but if you're making a top 20 of all dinosaurs ever, it's probably up there. And so is another one, which is Braille mm-hmm. Pelter, which is a nodosaur. And I would also say the Scalidosaurus in the UK which isn't an ankylosaur. That's the group that ultimately gave rise later to ankylosaurs. There's a Scalidosaurus in the UK, which I would also put right up there. I had a Scalidosaurus growing up. I just want to say that. So Scalosaurus at the Natural History Museum in London, unfortunately, it's in kind of like a hidden corner now. Yeah. Um, if you're in the dinosaur hall, so like if anyone's listening, they're in London, like it's an amazing specimen and it was... Like it's, it's very, it's, I mean, I'm using a lot of my notes and data that I've collected from looking at that specimen previously to interpret Zool and see how these two species are different. Um, it, it basically includes like all of the back um, with the armor mostly in place. And um, base, what's frustrating though, is that it's missing the skull and it like stops at the beginning of the tail club. So some of the like oh. more diagnostic parts are just missing, which is very frustrating. Um, but it's pretty, I mean, it's a beautiful, amazing specimen to like stand in front of. And it's cool because it's prepared from both sides. So you can like walk around it and yeah. see like the belly side and then you can see the backside and yeah. so it's lit very who, dramatically. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's on its side. So you can, so obviously ankylosaurs people, if there's a whole skeleton, people usually put them, you know, top down as if they were standing up. This one's very unusual and that it's flipped vertically. So it's basically lying on its right side um so you can yeah walk all the way around it and see the, yeah. the top and the underneath okay. and then boreallo pelta um is sort of like i don't know it, it feels like um like zool's cousin in a way in many ways so it was named just shortly after um yeah. zool was published so it's at the royal terrell museum in alberta in drumheller alberta and my friend um kayla brown worked on that and uh, it's another amazing specimen, but it's much older than Zool. So it's kind of cool because it's representing this other branch of the dinosaur family tree. It's also an amazingly preserved ankylosaur. It's, I think it is about 110 million years old. So Zool is about 75 million years old. So it's like this, yeah, just like a really cool kind of like um, complementary specimens that got published in the same summer, which was pretty fun. Um, and Boreal Pelta is beautiful. So it's like, um it just looks so different too it's this kind of beautiful like gray and black specimen zool is these like warm browns and sort of buff sandstone um and boreal pelta has uh like the the skull and all the way back to about the hips um preserved kind of in like 3d so it kind of looks like it's just like laying down for a nap so it's a really cool specimen oh that sounds that that sounds cute so okay so tell me tell me because we, we touched on it but um um scalidosaur how is that related to ankylosaurs and um yeah how 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 are they related yeah so the the big group that includes armored dinosaurs stegosaurs and ankylosaurs is called thyreophora and that means shield bearer which i think is a very cool evocative name i really like that name for the group um and so stegosaurs and ankylosaurs are part of this group of thyreophoran dinosaurs. And then, like in many groups, there's a few sort of very early um, 
representatives of Thyri Offra that don't quite fit into either of those groups yet. They just haven't really evolutionarily diverged from each other. So they're just like basal Thyri offerings. And Skeletosaurus is one of those. Um, okay. a- along with a little animal called Scutellosaurus, which I think is a very cute little name. Um, <laughs> Skeletosaurus is a really cool dinosaur. So some phylogenetic analyses place Skeletosaurus as an early ankylosaur rather than outside of ankylosaurs plus stegosaurs. It moves around a little bit depending on what characters you're using and what species and like who's doing the analysis, which is okay. Like that's how science goes. Um, But the sort of general consensus is that it's something that isn't a stegosaur and isn't an ankylosaur, um, but represents kind of the what that group would have looked like right at the beginning. So it still has lots of armor. It has kind of a long snout, um, uh, but it hasn't really specialized into like a very stegosaurus-y looking or ankylosaurus-y looking thing yet. That's that's one of the things I really like about, so this particularly good British specimen that we've got is, so yeah, Victoria says there's there's tons of armor on it, but there are lots and lots of rows of very little spikes. Mm -hmm. And from that, you can really see that pattern that she was talking about earlier, where if you take the stegosaur version of that, they've exaggerated the spikes in the midline and then got rid of the others. And the ankylosaurs have just made them more or less all a bit bigger until they get to the point that they all join up. And so rather than being a whole row of dots, you've got this solid block of armor. And it's, it's, I think that's one of the really cool bits of kind of dinosaurian evolution where you could just almost put Stegosaurus, Ankylosaurus, and below it, Scalidosaurus, and see that one body plan, even just from those three animals, just going in those two different directions. And once you put in a few of the others, it's really obvious kind of how they've changed. Where do you, where do you find a good Ankylosaur these days? Yeah, so Ankylosaurs are, have a global distribution, which is something that I think is cool about this group. People don't necessarily think about that, but they're found on every continent, including Antarctica. So wow. I think that's pretty special. Um, Who goes so... digging in Antarctica? <laughs> Cold um, people. <laughs> well, I, I would totally dig in Antarctica. Yeah. I, could. I don't like getting too hot, but I don't really mind being cold. So um, <laughs> I have like Very maple cold. syrup for blood and I've got like uh, some <laughs> extra layers of insulation, shall we say. So I'm usually OK in, uh, in like cold places. But anyway, um, so if you're looking for a tail clubbed ankylosaur, so this they have a more restricted distribution. If you're looking for a tail clubbed ankylosaur, an ankylosaurid ankylosaur, you have to look in the late Cretaceous only. And uh, you can only really find them in North America or Asia. So they are okay. like, they originate in Asia probably about 100 million years ago. And then they seem to have like migrated into North America and then diversified into a bunch of species in North America. Um, so if you want a tail club, you've got fewer options. But ankylosaurs as a whole, like especially notosaurs and like the earlier like representatives of Thyreophora, they are found worldwide and notosaurids are like all over the place, basically. So you can find them in Europe. You can find them in um, in uh, also in Asia. And uh, it's a notosaurid that was found in Antarctica. So on uh, James Ross Island. So sort of just south of um, it's like the little a little peninsula that comes up to meet like South America. Yeah, some osteoderms and bits and bobs of a skeleton have been found down there. It's been named Antarctopelta. I don't think it has any diagnostic characters yet that we know of, so I don't really consider that like a super valid name, um, but it's clearly a notosaur, whatever it is. So I, if we're talking about it, I usually just put like Antarctopelta in like quotation marks, basically, because it's clearly like something. Um, it's just really fragmentary right now. So if the distribution's that wide, what is it do you think they were eating? What sort of, because I mean, presumably they're quite adaptable. Yeah, so ankylosaurs, we know that they're herbivores for the most part. So they've got tiny, tiny, tiny little teeth. And what's actually really fun is, um, If you look at something like Ankylosaurus, which is this absolutely colossal, I didn't really answer this earlier. So most Ankylosaurid Ankylosaurs are about six meters long max. But then at the end of the Cretaceous and the Hell Creek formation, everything gets like super big really quickly. So you go, you know, that's where you get like Triceratops and T-Rex, like all like the biggest of the groups 
of like North American dinosaurs seem to happen like right at the very end. Uh, and in Kylosaurus, the namesake of the group, it, when I it, it's not known from particularly complete skeletons. But its skull is like more than twice as big as Zool's skull, for example. And Zool is a pretty big dinosaur. Um, and so depending on how that scales, uh, Ankylosaurus is probably like in the 8 to 10 meter length range. So that's a pretty big dinosaur. Um, you know, it's not like the biggest, but they're very beefy, beefy dinosaurs. So well, that's um, the thing. But there's, there's all the armor. And as you say, they're, they're so wide as well. I mean, yeah. the proportions of these things are like the, the pelvis is just the widest thing you've <laughs> ever seen for an animal that yeah that scale. they're very very wide and very flat right like they're yeah. just like they're not like humpy at all if that makes sense they don't have like much curve to them so they're just kind of like <laughs> like it's just like very a coffee table. <laughs> like a coffee table like they're not like perfectly flat but they're like surprisingly flat for an animal right so um so what's neat about Ankylosaurus is that its teeth, though, even though its skull is like twice as big as the next closest thing, their teeth are about the same size. So I think that if Ankylosaurus hadn't been wiped out at the end of the Cretaceous period, I suspect that they were kind of just like on their way to losing their teeth entirely. Mm -hmm. um, I think so. They were still clearly using them. They're very worn, like they, they were chewing for sure. But I think they probably were just like on their way to like reducing them completely and just like losing them all the way and just becoming like toothless completely um so they have a toothless beak at the front so notosaurids have a very narrow beak um and that usually suggests that an animal is like a bit choosier with its food that it's eating so it's kind of like picking and choosing the food and ankylosaurids have very wide beaks and so that usually suggests that they're just kind of like more indiscriminately like hoovering things down um but there's a couple of weird things about ankylosaurs. So they're very low to the ground. So they probably aren't browsing up in trees. You know, they can't really rear up on their hind legs, just the way their bodies are configured. A lot of their vertebrae are also like fused up. So they're, they're very stiff in their torso. So they just aren't very flexible dinosaurs. Um, and so they're probably browsing close to the ground. And so they're probably mostly eating ferns because at this time, like grass doesn't really exist yet. Like we don't have grasslands. So the, the low growing plants are mostly ferns. And a really cool thing is that Borealopelta, that notosaur I was talking about a few minutes ago, um, was found with gut contents preserved. And um, the team at the Terrell Museum just published a really cool paper where they analyzed the gut contents and they found that, yeah, like the bulk of what it was eating was ferns and, you know, like some other plants, but mostly ferns. Uh, but what was also cool was there was a fair bit of charcoal in its gut. So it was probably browsing in an area where ferns were growing um, relatively soon after a forest fire. So That's I thought cool. that was like pretty neat because, you know, that's it's just like this sort of little evocative like picture that you can like imagine of like a forest fire and then things regrowing and the same kyles are coming in to like munch on things or or it was an artist and it was sketching <laughs> and licking its fingers even Ooh. though it didn't have fingers it could have been that i was sure you were going to go for a barbecue joke and it was oh, oh, I see. I surprised artisanal you. char grilled <laughs> ferns we're getting into like cracking artist territory here. I feel. Like. Oh no! <laughs> so, let's, leave, let, let's leave that one. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, I've already done a poster uh, for this podcast with uh, dinosaurs flying uh, planes, so you don't want to. Ooh, ooh, I love it. Dinosaur command. <laughs> Dave puts up with a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so some other neat things about ankylosaur diet. You might think that it's very like simple, like okay, they eat plants, but there's some sort of like weird other things that happen. So there is one example of. Uh, and ankylosaur potentially doing something very weird, and I'd really like to see more of these specimens myself, because I will admit that I am somewhat skeptical, but there are these little small ankylosaurs from China, like deposits in China. Uh, it's an animal called Leoningosaurus, and um, at least one has been found with fish in its gut cavity. And so there was the idea that they might be piscivorous, so like specialized fish eaters. Um, I'm not like super convinced, but I do think it's very interesting. And I think it warrants further investigation because there clearly were like fish in the gut cavity. The question is how they got there. Like, did it eat them? Did they just wash in by accident? Uh. Do they regularly eat them? Or was this, you know, like what's going on there? Right. 
Um, and the issue is also like, these are very, very small. Like how, so they're like 30 centimeters long. Like all the ones that have been found are very tiny. Oh. I think they probably represent juveniles, but there's been an argument that these are adults and they're aquatic adapted, which would be like very weird for an ankylosaur. So there's just like a whole lot of like interesting questions left to answer about this particular species that... A 30 centimeter long swimming adult. That is the cutest thing. As, as right. Victoria said, you, you can stick some maybes at the end of that. I know. I have I have seen a couple of bigger ones at a collection in, in East China. I've seen a okay. couple which were more like 50 or so. I mean, it's still obviously... small. I mean, yeah, yeah definitely very, very small. Um, right. And then as as you and I both know, but most of the listeners won't, so, so much of this stuff from Liao Ning. So we've talked about feathered dinosaurs on the pod repeatedly. The thing with all the feathered stuff is... The feathers and the soft tissues and things are there, and that's amazing. The skeletons look like someone's hit them with a hammer, and basically yeah. every bone is almost shattered. So you can see the outline, and the even the outlines of individual bones are almost certainly exactly what the outlines of those bones really were. So we can actually get some really good detailed anatomy of things like the shapes of crests where muscles attached and the lengths of bones mm -hmm. and the widths of bones and stuff like this. But Obviously, juvenile dinosaurs, we haven't really done juvenile dinosaurs yet, but one of the key things that you see in certainly juvenile dinosaurs you don't see in adults is the way the bones are separated. So bones fuse to various bits of the skeleton fuse together as the animal grows. That's basically impossible to see in a shattered skeleton. And so a lot of the features we would look for to determine whether or not things like Leoningsaurus is a juvenile or an adult, you can't see, um, which is kind of a problem. <laughs> Yeah. It's a problem. I mean, it's not like a problem. It's a it's a scientific problem that is fun. It's a to question solve, right? that is unanswered. Yeah, it's, a, it's an unanswered question, but it's it's the sort of thing we can. It's it's not even like hard to answer necessarily, right? Like we could test to see if it's a juvenile by cutting up some of the bones. Yeah. Um, we just need a few more specimens that might more definitively show that it's like a gut content rather than like just washed into the rib cage. So it's it's a totally solvable problem with a bit of time and luck. Um, it's not we, one of these like or if we found a really big one. mysteries. Or if we found a really big one. So so I'm sort of optimistic that we will get an answer to that eventually. Um, and I know that there's a few people working on at least the the ontogeny problem, like the growth stage problem um, with a couple of specimens. So that's great. So hopefully in a few years, there will be some more info about that. But super interesting ankylosaur, um, still a lot to learn. And like, why not? I mean, there's lots of variety in feeding adaptations among animals today. And ankylosaurs were a pretty big, diverse group of dinosaurs. And we know that the fossil record is biased towards like large animals that live near rivers. So maybe there were small ankylosaurs living near lakes that adapted to this particular lifestyle. So I'm certainly not like opposed to it by any stretch. I'm just, I'm like a little bit skeptical still just based on like the one paper that's been been published so far, but I think it's super interesting. I and then a final I, thing. Okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, I have a final question for you before your final thing. Okay. Is, um, we, we've, we've all suffered in this episode before we started recording uh, with wanting to sneeze. So I want to know about their, <laughs> their noses. Oh, nose. Okay, that's perfect because this is related to what I was going to talk about in terms of like diet as well. So, ankylosaurs have extremely weird noses, like possibly the weirdest noses of all dinosaurs. So, Larry Whitmer at um, Ohio University, or sorry, University of Ohio. Now I'm forgetting. Sorry, Larry. I, I get mixed up about it's, the it's like the US naming convention sometimes. But anyway, in Ohio, um, Larry Whitmer uh, has CT scanned and imaged the inside of some ankylosaur skulls and you know you would expect when you ct scan a dinosaur skull that the nasal passage so like you know sort of the tube in your head that goes from like your nostril to your windpipe would just be like you know basically straight like you know curved like a straight path so you know mm -hmm. you like breathe in it like goes up into your nose and down into your throat and ta-da uh so ankylosaurs instead of doing that extremely sensible thing do a very weird thing where it's like a crazy straw so you know like when you get those like swirly straws as a kid and it goes like all over so it goes up it loops and then it like loops again to the side and then it like loops over itself and goes down into the throat and it's incredibly weird and there have been some really cool um Really cool studies showing how the air is moving through that by my friend Jason um, Jason Burke, and he has shown sort of the airflow through it. It probably has to do with cooling the brain at some level. 
Um, we know that the inside of ankylosaur nasal passages were very highly vascularized, so there were lots of blood vessels, and that would probably help cool it down. It probably doesn't have, like, a lot to do with their sense of smell. They do have decently sized olfactory lobes for processing smell information, but not, like, you know, outrageously huge. And you're getting all that from the shape of their skull, or have you got the actual more detailed preservation? So I know you've got the skin, but surely you haven't got the actual... How can you tell? about the you know the the blood and everything else ah okay yeah that's a great question so there's a couple examples of ankylosaur skulls where they're they're broken at sort of the level where you can see into the nasal passage so the nasal passage is like a hole inside the skull and we can see basically grooves for the blood vessels inside Ah, the top of the nasal passage um on some of these so we wouldn't see it if the skull wasn't broken it's not even the sort of thing that's easy to pick up with a ct scanner so it's one of these kind of like serendipitously broken specimens that we would never break it ourselves but if it was like naturally broken that way you can see some interesting things um and then the shape of the brain we can get from ct scans you know we can like image the skull and then sort of like digitally separate out what the brain looks like and what these nasal passages look like um and so yeah so there's clearly some really weird things going on with ankylosaur skulls it's also entirely possible that they were using that to make sound so like as a resonating chamber so maybe they were honking as well so you know lots Lots of things have more than one function. Um, the, the main thing, though, probably has to do with cooling the brain. That's probably like the main reason that they evolved this. So they have these really weird noses, um, the broad snouted tail clubbed ankylosaurs. Most of them, their nostrils open, you know, kind of on the front of the skull. So they have kind of like a little piggy snout almost. But ankylosaurus does a weird thing where it pulls its nostrils like around to the side of the snout and then they point straight downwards and are kind of like roofed on the top so if you looked at an ankylosaur from ankylosaurus from the top or the front you wouldn't actually see its nostrils and that's like pretty weird like why did it change that so much it could smell Um, its own armpits I like um, the fact that that's the first thing you thought of. Well, Izzy. I just like that. It's like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, ours point down. Our noses point down a bit. It's, and I'm not doing a great job explaining it. So I would just, I would encourage listeners to like at some point go Google it. So you'll have a better idea of what I'm talking about. Um, but so I thought that was very interesting. And I was kind of like, are, what other animals do this? And like, why would it do this weird thing um, and sort of shift the position of its nostrils so dramatically? And so the closest thing I can really think of as extant analogs are things that are burrowing animals. So animals that are sort of using their skull to push dirt aside. Um, the problem is that there's those are generally things that live fully subterraneanly, like fully underground, things like Sicilians um, or like burrowing snakes, things like that. Um, and so clearly an ankylosaur that is like eight or 10 meters long is not like burrowing through the ground like a mole or like something like that. Um, but I are did get sure? me to, uh, like, like pretty sure. <laughs> because it'd be awesome if you think about yeah. it, if you had, if you had all the spikes just out the ground with the tail whipping, like a, some sort of scary sort of like booby trap. I guess nothing's impossible, but I don't <laughs> think that's what's happening. Oh, okay. I don't think that I don't think we have a lot of support for that. Okay. Um, but I do think it's really interesting. So an idea I have sort of put out there in the literature that I think should get some more attention at some point is could they have been kind of rooting in the ground? So they're not like burrowing, but are they using their snout to kind of push dirt or or root around in the ground? Are they eat, looking for things like mushrooms or tubers or even like bugs? So like maybe they weren't strictly herbivores. Maybe they were actually like looking for insects and maybe were a bit more omnivorous. And I think... I think that's really interesting. And then like while I was writing that paper um, a few years ago about ankylosaurs, another very interesting uh, ankylosaur was described called uh, a kinocephalus. And that's from Utah. And it independently also evolved sort of retracted sheltered nostrils. And if you look at the skull of uh, a kinocephalus, it, it has like some of its like cranial armor actually like pokes out forwards like a little shovel. Um, and the original authors didn't really like address this a whole lot. Um, that if you go back and look at its closest relative, so a kinocephalus's closest relative is Notocephalosaurus from New Mexico. And it's not quite as well preserved, but you can also see that it probably had a similar little like shovel like shelf to it, the front of its snout. So there's at least a 
a couple of ankylosaurs that are like doing something really weird with the front of their nose. It's not really clear why they're doing this. I'm very open to like other hypotheses. I think it being somewhat related to foraging is a good starting point. And I think it's pretty interesting. And I don't have a good sense for exactly how we test some of these ideas, but you know, things start with observations and then maybe uh, some grad student who's smarter than me and more insightful will come up with a way to actually test it at some point. So yeah, so basically I think there's still like tons to learn about ankylosaurs, even just something as simple as like what they're eating um, is not like, and you know, we keep getting surprised by like dinosaur diet things. Like there was the study of, uh, a year or two ago by Karen Chin showing that like, you know, hadrosaurs were like semi-regularly eating rotten wood and sometimes they whoops also ate crabs while they were doing that. And so there's, you know, like, I think there's just a lot we don't know still. Um, so herbivore is like maybe overly simplistic for some dinosaurs. Well, you get, you know, most most creatures like deers and that will eat baby birds and that's the thing if they're yeah. in the way. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. yeah absolutely. Well, so, plus, plus at some level, you know, pe- people always overlook this, but basically all herbivores are sort of omnivorous in the sense that, you know, trees are covered in insects and spiders yeah. and things and cows are not sitting there as they go through a field picking off each yeah. little fly larvae and aphid. And and in some cases, this is a fairly hefty percentage of the protein and stuff they're eating. So, yeah, I, I don't think, in a strict level, there is virtually no such thing as a herbivore. Yeah, um, and then the it's question like, is, yeah, then it's, as you say, like, like an how adaptation much, for it Right, now. and then how much are they, how much of this is, 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 he says, you know, a chance hoovering up an odd bit of meat because it's available, Yeah, and how much this is coincidental consumption, and how much of this is active targeting. And as you say, in particular, what you'd really want as a, as a biologist interested in behavior of, of these animals is an adaptation that would really set you on the path. Yeah. Very quickly, because I'm just curious and you'll be very generous with your time and moi, right? But the whole nasal thing, is it possible that they're built that way because they have some, you know, something that's rotted away, some sort of um, flesh that's like a trunk or like a tube? Or Is there any possibility oh. of that? Or is it the specimens are already well preserved enough that you know it's not there? I don't think it would be something like a trunk, but I know there's uh, some very interesting speculation in like the paleo art community about what exactly ankylosaurs are doing with their noses. So if you look at the nose of an ankylosaur like Euoplocephalus, or especially some of the ones from Mongolia, so if you look up animals like Cychania or Panacosaurus, and you look at their nose, they are very weird when you really sit there and look at them and like internalize what you're looking at. Because there's there's usually kind of like a little scooped out cavity and the nostril like sits in that cavity. But there's also other holes in that cavity that just go to like random sinuses in the skull that have nothing to do with the airway. Um, and it's not like really super clear like why it looks like that. And I know there's been some speculation that that maybe it is like very fleshy in there. Maybe there's some sort of like very like maybe they're very mucusy or something. Like I'm not really <laughs> sure. Um, so yeah, the soft tissues of the nose of an like the nostril of an ankylosaur is like I don't think very well resolved right now, and I think it's like pretty interesting. Um, their skulls are just so fused up and like s- solid and rigid besides that, that I don't think they're hosting something like a trunk. They also have this beak. So I don't think like a proboscis or like a trunk or even like a tapir, or, like a really fleshy pig snout is very, is very likely, but I, I don't really know like why they are. I do. I do not know why they do what they do. <laughs> <laughs> Um, We do know, however, that they probably had very fleshy tongues because Rob Hill, another one of my colleagues, published a paper a few years ago on a specimen from uh, either China or Mongolia of uh, Panacosaurus. And they have these very big bones um, that sit kind of in the throat and would be where the tongue would anchor. So we're not talking like a chameleon tongue, but, you know, a big fleshy tongue, like maybe like a giraffe would have. So something that's very good, possibly very muscular and able to like manipulate um, things, you know, kind of like grasp a little bit. Uh, so that's also entirely uh, plausible. So basically, I'm just saying, like, Kylosers are like the most disgusting possible option of <laughs> I was all dinosaurs. Good like, snog. 
nice yeah, and mucusy okay. with a big tongue. Possibly, That's what you want. <laughs> possibly very disgusting noses. Possibly very disgusting tongue. Not very smart. Very <laughs> fat and like <laughs> spiky and like not that this, fat is bad, but like very spiky and knobbly. This, and, like, I was going to say this. This sounds like the average <laughs> Tinder match, doesn't it? <laughs> no. I, 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 I was thinking they'd make good Vogons. <laughs> the Hitchhikers go oh, to the Galaxy fans. Oh, they yes, might make good Vogons. Extremely, extremely, bad bad <laughs> yeah, extremely bad poetry. Extremely bad poetry. Guaranteed. That's a scientific fact. I will vouch for that. So um. <laughs> I think I think this is. I mean, I've got so much here that I've got to. Yeah, it's brilliant. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you. You know, Ankylosaurus is one of those like classic dinosaurs. Like a lot of people know what it is, yeah. and it's like three skulls and a bit of postcrania. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Like, I mean, well, it's like really, you know, is right. Like poster child and there's two. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, there's just, yeah, a lot to learn still. Yeah. About all of them. Except yeah. T-Rex. Yeah. We know yeah. enough about I'm just joking. <laughs> no, well, yeah, yes, yes and no. Yeah, if, if, only, if only some people would slow up and, and maybe read some of the literature before they write the next paper on it. That'd be nice. <laughs> yeah. so th this is the one advantage Victoria has. If you work on a group that no one else works on, there's very few people constantly telling you you're wrong. Uh, well, we're one at Carlos scavenger. scavengers. You'd be surprised. But... Well, all right, that's... <laughs> But, but yes, I mean, it's certainly a reason I wanted to work on them when I first got started was just there was, I basically told myself I didn't really want to do anything near tyrannosaurs or feathered dinosaurs, even though I think they're super cool, because there were just so many people already working on it. I wanted to be able to like, go shine a light right, on somewhere right, yeah. that has a little bit less work. Um, so that's not to like diminish the work people have done before me by any stretch, but there were just like fewer people yeah. um, actively working on it. And there were a lot of questions to answer still. So it's been kind of fun to do that. And now I'm starting to like work on other things too, which is great. So I picked another really sexy group of dinosaurs, the Leptoceratops. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> all, all both of them. <laughs> Yeah, are, they, so are they the ones on their hind feet? No, so leptoceratopsids are kind of like, um, if you take, do you know what protoceratops looks like? I do. Oh, yeah, the, that's the one on its hind foot with the cheeks. Cheek spikes. Um, no. Yeah, no, I think uh, it's Cetacosaurus yeah. is what she's thinking of. So, yeah, so kind of, no, no, but that's pretty close. So, like, take, like, a Cetacosaurus, but make it a little bit stockier and probably walking mostly on all four legs. Okay. And then make its head, like, really deep. Like okay. super outrageous, like, like more parity than yeah. Basically, yeah. basically take yeah. Triceratops, cut the horns off, make him look like he's got agromegaly, and yeah. then make him about five feet long rather yeah. than twenty five yeah. feet long, and that's yeah. it. They're oh. they're pretty weird. Like mean, honestly, they're just they're kind of weird looking. So yeah, like a horned horned dinosaur with no horns and no frill. But like okay. Protoceratops, they're, they're a weird, they're, they're kind of... I'm thinking of like by, a by chunky time... parrot, I'm afraid. I don't know if yeah, that's pretty right. Much. Which, no, which no, but it, yeah, like, like a sheep parrot. <laughs> I don't know. Oh. Like... The sheep parrot dinosaur. Yes. Even yeah. that's yeah. more sensible than Zool, though. So... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Terrible Lizards podcast. If you want Terrible Lizards to keep bringing you more information about the world of dinosaurs, then we need to hear from you. Send us your dinosaur drawings and ask us your questions via terriblelizards.co.uk. Email terriblelizardspod at gmail.com. Find us on Patreon, Facebook, and at Izzy underscore Lawrence and at Dave underscore Hone on Twitter. Include the hashtag Terrible Lizards. We're hoping to bring you more and more but we can only do that if we get enough listeners so please like share and subscribe <laughs>